your choice of colours. That's good. So it just takes a few seconds for this to uh, set the recording and get this started on YouTube, and then we'll we'll go straight. Okay, so that's fine. So we are on there. Uh, uh, so let me go back to share screen where we were. It was here. Uh, uh, yep. So nearly there. Uh, there are some people are still coming in, but we're gonna we we gonna get gently started. Yep. So the floor is yours, Barbara. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce David Elliott, who is the most senior surgeon from the Chelmsford, uh, St. Andrew's Hospital in Chelmsford. He is a hand surgeon that I think probably most of the UK plastic surgical community know and abroad. He was a past president of the British Society for Surgery of the Hand and a past editor of the journal Our Hand Surgery. <clears throat> and he was also a past examiner of the uh, European Diploma of Hand Surgery. So he's going to talk to you about uh, the secondary reflex tendon surgery. So without further ado, take it away. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Elliott. I'm a hand surgeon in the UK. Um, Last week, um, I discussed primary flexor tendon repair, uh, and this week, Carlos has asked me to discuss secondary flexor tendon surgery with you. The indications to undertake primary flexor surgery are obvious, and the results, uh, as you see again here, are, uh, are as above. Um, we spent the last 50 years talking about primary surgery, very little thought has been directed towards the secondary uh, surgery for flexor tendons. And while primary surgery has moved on, secondary surgery has moved on very little. And any discussion on this subject inevitably has to look back to the 1970s and 80s for information on surgical technique, for scientific papers and for means of assessing the results as very little has been written on this subject since then. In Western Europe, much of our, pri of our flexor tendon surgery is primary surgery, and secondary surgery for us is mostly that of the complications of primary repair. And these constitute about 10% of all primary repairs. However, in many parts of the world, um, for example, rural India, uh, many patients will only get to an appropriate surgeon at a time when secondary repair of the tendon using grafts is the only option because of proximal muscle retraction. Nevertheless, when one comes... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Elliott. I'm a hand surgeon in the UK. Um, Last week, um, I discussed primary flexor tendon repair, uh, and this week, Carlos has asked me to discuss secondary flexor tendon surgery with you. The indications and the results, uh, as you see again here, are, uh, are as above. Um, we spent the last 50 years talking about primary surgery, very little thought has been directed towards the secondary uh, surgery for flexor tendons. And while primary surgery has moved on, secondary surgery has moved on very little. And any discussion on this subject inevitably has to look back to the 1970s and 80s for information on surgical technique, for scientific papers and for means of assessing the results as very little has been written on this subject since then. In Western Europe, much of our, pri of our flexor tendon surgery is primary surgery, and secondary surgery for us is mostly that of the complications of primary repair. And these constitute about 10% of all primary repairs. 
However, in many parts of the world, um, for example, rural India, uh, many patients will only get to an appropriate surgeon at a time when secondary repair of the tendon using grafts is the only option because of proximal muscle retraction. Nevertheless, when one compares what we actually do technically in both circumstances, our problems are not so different. Uh, I touched on this subject last week and I'll stress it again as I think it's important. My secondary surgery group of patients, mostly but not all, are failures of primary surgery and include bad injuries and bad patients. So they are likely to do badly again and may do no better after secondary surgery than they did the first time. Describing patients in this context as bad is not a moral judgment. Um, this, in group, this group contains um, many who, through no fault of their own, cannot involve in our, uh, our plan of rehabilitation. So I think we need to ask the question before any secondary tendon surgery, why has the primary surgery failed? And follow this up with the thought, what are we going to do differently to get a better result uh, this time? And the bottom box suggests a few ways to counter these failures. So for example, if a tenolysis patient has a low pain threshold, give him or her more painkillers, whether as a, a marking pain buster immediately after surgery, or a long-acting oral opiate, or, or both. Group five, the ones who simply don't cooperate are difficult. Psychological manipulation and time spent are probably the only weapons we have against them in civilian practice. However, the therapists often have these patients under their care for longer throughout the aftermath of their primary surgery and can often improve their compliance, or they can tell you that secondary surgery is like to, likely to meet with the same response again. The reported results of secondary flexor surgery are generally worse than those of primary surgery. The mode of reconnection of the tendons may or may not be relevant, but other factors make secondary surgery less likely to achieve good results. It's generally been recognized over the last 50 years that limbs repaired immediately and moved early do better because they don't stiffen in scar tissue and they don't develop contractures during healing. Surgery in scarred tissue is also much more difficult and less likely to be followed by good movement, even if mobilization is immediate. So these truisms apply to the digits and hands without uh, flexor tendons as much as they do in other parts of hand surgery. This we can change at least uh, in some of our patients and in some, and some of the time by doing more primary surgery. So I, I think it's profitable to look at techniques allowing us to do this. The move towards primary surgery was pioneered in the 1950s, and in most parts of the world, this remains a medical political battle about the distribution of hand casualties and the training of more surgeons and therapists. And most of us individually only ever have limited influence on this. However, we can tilt the balance in our own practice. First, we can make every effort to avoid our primary repairs failing, uh, and I covered this in my first lecture. And secondly, there are a number of technical tricks we can use to, uh, to allow more primary repairs. When the FPL tendon is cut, the muscle retracts more than the finger flexor muscles. And primary repair is often difficult or even impossible after only two or three days. Lengthening the proximal FPL tendon uh, within the muscle can allow a delayed primary repair. The Liviette technique of lengthening the FPL is shown here. Although the tendon has been cut, the muscle has not, and the muscle maintains the continuity needed to allow immediate mobilization. A single cut will give about half to three quarters of a centimeter in extra tendon length distally. If one repeats this cut again, about one to two centimeters from the first cut, but still within the muscle, uh, uh, the second cut will give another quarter centimeter of lengthening. This can also be sometimes useful in primary flexor surgery for cut finger flexors or profundus pull-offs who present late and also in cases presenting with small segments of tendon missing.
the significance of this paper written back in the 1960s was not appreciated at that time. It identifies the fact that delayed primary repair is possible far more often than thought. At the time, everyone in North America was trying to get their heads around the new kleinert verda philosophy of immediate repair and mobilization. However, the hand units were still receiving patients from accident departments and family doctors at quite long uh, times after the initial injury, as the senders still expected them to be treated by secondary grafting. McFarlane, better known for his work on Jupiterans, uh, and his colleagues tried to do primary repairs in 100 patients sent to them, whatever the delay. And you can see that 24 of these patients arrived more than six months after the initial injury. That the flexors in 36 of 100 fingers could be repaired directly even months after the injury negates the assumption that delayed presentation necessitates tendon grafting routinely. And the, if you add the possibility of Liviet tendon lengthening, described 20 years later, uh, McFarlane's figure of 36 might have been even higher. So we are now much more aggressive in our policy with respect to late presentations. If a patient comes late and the finger is mobile passively, we explore it immediately. If the tendon ends won't quite come together, we do Liviet lengthening. If repair still proves impossible, uh, then a graft can be done with no loss of time, or a silicon rod can be put in as the first stage of a two-stage grafting procedure. I mentioned this paper in my earlier lecture on primary surgery. The technique was being suggested as an alternative to secondary tendon grafting. Uh, I think the full possibilities for it in primary surgery have, have yet uh, to be explored. This splitting of the profundus tendon of an adjacent finger offers a third way of achieving immediate primary repair after a delayed presentation uh, if Liviet lengthening is not enough. Uh, this idea was an extension of our halving of the distal FTP to get it through the A4 pulley when the, after a profundus pull-off or less often a sharp injury uh, to the tendon in zone one when it arrives late. Slow traction may get it through the pulley, but post-operative swelling is likely to make it stick in the pulley with little or no movement of the DIP joint thereafter. This paper, in which we analyzed zone one flexor results before we started halving, halving the profundus to get it through the A4 uh, more easily, identifies, albeit in a small number of cases, that six of nine avulsions pulled through by by slow traction and poor DIP movement in the long run. The alternative of secondary grafting can be avoided by halving the double-barreled distal part of the profundus, which is reasonable as half of the profundus is bigger than the palmaris from the same hand that you would be using as a graft, and it's much easier to suture. The problem of the A2 pulley and not repairing FDS we covered in the earlier lecture and I've now moved my earlier opinion from doing this only in selected cases to Professor Tang's view of doing it for all injuries under the A2 pulley, as this is more certain of avoiding adhesion problems. During the last 30 years, I've had a number of patients in whom both tendons were repaired under the A2 pulley at primary surgery, and then the edematous tendons became stuck and secondary tenolysis with removal of the FTS was necessary. Uh, Tang's single tendon repair at the primary operation would have avoided this. Unfortunately, the problem of primary uh, rupture, uh, primary repair rupture, hasn't disappeared either in uh, our unit or worldwide. However, re-repairing our ruptures is often possible uh, and reduces the number of secondary procedures uh, we have to do if we re-repair the, the tendon straight away. Not all tendons can, can be re-repaired immediately, but, uh, but many of them can. In 2006, we analyzed the results of about 40 re-repairs in zones one and two done uh, in our unit over 15 years. Overall, only about 50% eventually had good or excellent results and 12.5% ruptured for a second time. However, if one separates the little finger from the others, the results of re-repair in the other fingers on the left are much better um, and 
this is a reasonable thing to do, I think, for these fingers. But immediate re-repair re is questionable for the little finger, at least if the re-repairs are done as we did them with the same two-strand technique we used for the primary repair. Again, although we've not yet tried for this problem, this half profundus technique may be the answer to the bad results of primary suture of the little finger tendon division in zone one and two. As this technique moves the goalposts from tendon sutures within the sheath to one distal tendon suture to the terminal phalanx, which can be made stronger and doesn't have to glide. So, using these tricks, we can play our best card, primary flexor repair, more often and reduce the need for secondary surgery. While we can define secondary flexor tendon surgery as primary surgery not done or failed, um, we can also define it in respect of what we actually do. And this is how we defined it in this small study. These were the pathologies we identified uh, and as you can see here, the procedures necessary in any one digit are likely to be multiple. Uh, and these are what we actually did in, in the cases studied. So these statements on operating lists are often a gross simplification of the surgery actually needed. Looking first at tenolysis, all of the tissues on the front of the finger may be scarred to a variable degree and each layer may require treatment. It also needs to be remembered that before even starting, we need the extensor tendon on the back of the finger to be free to move distally and allow finger flexion. And the final active flexion after either of tenolysis or grafting is unlikely to be greater than the passive flexion possible before this surgery, as the tenolysis or grafting will make more fibre and edema to stick the extensor. Scarring of the skin and the subcutaneous fat may cause longitudinal skin shortening. Uh, the mid-lateral incision with a proximal palm or V allows one to advance a V of skin from the palm into the finger. And this is usually enough to deal with skin shortage where the skin injury has been a simple cut. We don't close the V as a Y, but allow it to epithelialize under a moist antiseptic dressing done by the patient daily much like a fingertip skin loss. And the wounds close over a couple of weeks. This shows the scarring of the subcutaneous tissue um, from healing of the initial injury and possibly a primary surgery, which is why there is a skin shortage in most of these cases. And you also see it here thickening the tendon sheath. To get to the tendons, we uh, can, we are taught that we can remove all of the sheath except the A2 and the A4 pulleys, which incidentally releases the longitudinal effect of scarring of the sheath. Now we also preserve an A3 pulley, as you see here, for reasons I'll explain shortly. Next is the actual tenolysis. This can be difficult to do without doing more damage than good, so it needs time. Even the slightest small strand of fibrous tissue linking the tendon to its surrounds will lose the game by stopping the, uh, the free tendon movement. If the tendons themselves are too swollen uh, under the A2 pulley, I remove the FDS. After freeing everything uh, up to this point, the finger may still not straighten because of ligament tightening of the interphalangeal joints. The PIP may only require proximal release of the palmar plate, but much more often the accessory collateral ligaments also have to be released. And if the scarring is more severe, the true lateral ligaments uh, need releasing from the middle phalanx too. If the volar plate is very thick with scar, as you see here, it can be excised and replaced with the distal part of the FDS tendon thinned down and sutured to the proximal phalanx. However, these injured fingers, particularly in adult occasions with big hands, are unlikely to swan neck if the volar plate is simply excised. I find anything short of complete excision of a contracted volar plate at the DIP doesn't work either to straighten the joint or to keep it straight in the long term. An alternative for the DIP is to fuse the joint straight or near straight uh, particularly where there's a combination of PIP and DIP flexion 
and a hook finger uh, as this uh, takes away the hooking by straightening the, the, the one of the two bent joints. Even after all this, the fingers may not straighten because of shortening of the muscles in the forearm, uh, in which case I do a levier lengthening. If a primary repair is likely to stick, if not mobilized immediately, any secondary procedure will do the same. After tenolysis, of course, there's no repair to protect and much more aggressive early rehab can be used. And we start this the next day under a marking nerve block, uh, now using a pain buster. I never use special regimes such as Dr. Strickland's frayed tendon regime. Uh, I feel that if the tendon is so frayed after tenolysis that I don't think it will survive routine rehabilitation, um, I replace it with a tendon graft, as I believe that asking the therapist to do a special regime which they seldom use on a shabby tendon is likely to lead either to a stuck tendon or a snapped one, and this places the blame on the therapist. Moving on to grafting, at the top are the problems needing tendon reconnection and below are the possible options of treatment. Treatment four is mostly used temporarily while waiting for fingers to soften. It's used occasionally as a long-term solution in the elderly and more occasionally when a younger patient simply tires of our failures to, to restore his finger function. It's used occasionally as a long-term solution uh, in, in other situations. The late presentation of FPL divisions, especially of the non-dominant thumb, may require no surgery, as the patient often can use the thumb perfectly well without IP flexion. And many patients in this circumstance will simply not want to waste time uh, on surgery. And patients with a good functioning FDS and 95 degrees of PIP flexion may not need a divided profundus replacing to achieve DIP flexion on a ring middle or little uh, a ring middle or index finger. The little finger is different. It needs to flex to the DIP to close the, the, the grip on the hand and stop things dripping out, dropping out of the ulnar side of the hand and also for uh, competent gripping. Um, the distal stump of the profundus, if it's not repaired, may need tethering uh, to the middle phalanx to stop the DIP hyperextending when the digit is gripping. Alternatively, one can fuse the DIP joint. It's been debated for a long time whether one should ever put a graft through a good functioning FDS, as it may tether and scar postoperatively, worsening the function of this finger. I understand this view, and I think this should only be done uh, as a two-stage procedure and by surgeons with excellent hand therapy departments to reduce the likelihood of this problem. Whether we should be carrying out single-stage or two-stage tendon grafting routinely or a mixture of both depending on the individual case is a matter of opinion with little hard fact in the literature to support either side of the argument. Going back a bit in time, this was the biggest survey of secondary grafts ever done, and Boys, who was Bunnell's successor, identified these two groups of patients uh, who make up about a third of, his, of all his cases with very poor results from his grafting. Uh, and this is when the idea of two-stage tendon grafting took off, although it had been mooted uh, earlier. This avoids putting a tendon graft into a badly scarred flexor sheath by first inserting a silicon rod to create a false sheath, then a few months later putting in the graft. I always used two-stage grafting, partly as I was brought up at a time and in a place where it was believed to give the best results, and partly as most of my cases for tendon grafting are failures of primary surgery who are less than perfect material for flexor surgery. Sometimes it seems that this is overkill, but the sheath is not bad, as the sheath is not badly scarred at the operation. But we can never be sure how much scar will form after this second operation in any particular patient. Also, if operating for the first time on a secondary case, we have no idea what the patient's scar reaction to surgery will be or who will prove to be a, a bad patient who cannot or will not cooperate with therapy. Uh, we're also 
making our decisions about this, uh, when the tissue between the tendon and the sheath is as beautiful and diaphanous as on the upper left, we talk of adhesions, and two-stage grafting looks like overkill. When we meet with something such as you see on the bottom right, we tend to talk of not of adhesions but of scarring. However, uh, we need to remember that both of these uh, types of scarring will stop movement. The circumstances of your own hand practice may push you uh, more towards single stage grafting. However, there may be circumstances, circumstances where this expedient uh, may be so unlikely to give a good result that uh, two stage grafting should be considered. It's also worth, possibly worth a thought again that the two-stage graft was introduced because of dissatisfaction with the results of the one-stage procedure in the hands of experts such as boys who had been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. And the, the situation in respect of what has to be done uh, in these fingers hasn't changed since that time. We all routinely use the palmaris uh, for grafting if it's present. When absent, convention is that we go to the foot and harvest, harvest plantaris. I've stopped doing this for three reasons. The first is that most of our patients have their surgery under brachial block anesthetic, and this requires a time-wasting mid-operation conversion to general anesthesia. The second is that the plantaris is not always there, uh, but we may not uh, discover this until we've opened the, the skin of the leg. And thirdly, plantaris is a very thin and miserable tendon, which is difficult to handle and suture. So my second op option is now the extensor indices, as losing it rarely affects index finger extension. It's rarely absent. Yeah, it's a good match for the, for the tendon in size, and it can be harvested under the brachial block that uh, initially was being used. At the distal end, we got rid of the button some time ago by using a suture through the tuft of the distal phalanx instead. The button is mostly not a problem, but it can occasionally be troublesome, and this is a, a very simple alternative with few problems. And uh, it's also much cheaper than using a bone tag although a tag is equally effective for this job. I re routinely do this dis distal fixation first and the proximal weave second. Others do things the other way around. Either works and which you like depends on your technique of tensioning the construct. With respect to the actual technique of joining tendons, I've little to add to the excellent technique which we all know as the Pulvertaf weave. Whether one uses the FDS or the FTP muscle as the motor for the graft is debated. I usually use the FTP if available, but this doesn't seem to matter. Whether one takes the graft back to the wrist or does the weave in the palm is also a matter of preference. I routinely do the weave in the palm as this is the natural length of the palmaris tendon and of the EI. So I identify the palmaris at the wrist pull on it and feel it in the mid forearm, make another small nick over it through the skin fat and fascia, cut the tendon there and harvest the tendon through the, uh, through the incision at the wrist. To harvest a palmaris long enough to reach the wrist requires taking the part of the palmaris in the muscle also using a vein stripper. If grafting from the palm and using profundus, the lumbrical will be intact and connected to the proximal tendon and motor. This creates a risk of the problem first identified by the British surgeon Athol Parks. If your graft attached distal to the lumbrical is too long, the forearm muscle will pull through the lumbrical and cause interphalangeal joint extension, not flexion. However, this is a, a rare problem. Uh, it can be avoided by routinely div dividing the lumbrical when doing the proximal weave. Um, I don't do this routinely unless I see that the lumbrical is scarred in the palm or where it runs into its tunnel distally. Um, and I've very rarely seen this lumbrical plus Athol Park effect um, occur. One thing I do, which is not routine, is to use a continuous running suture woven up the length of the pulvertaf weave, then back to its starting point. 
uh, and knotted only once at this point, rather than the, uh, the time-honored many separate stitches, which leaves an array of knots and spiky suture ends, particularly if using proline, uh, along the surface of the weave, which I feel must leave uh, the, 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 the weave with a, an increased friction and the likely and more likelihood of, of catching. The continuous stitch is also much quicker. Uh, with this continuous stitch, if the needle is going to, going to cut a previous pass of the suture, it does this at the time and not later, and one simply knots the divided suture and keeps going. But uh, in my experience, this rarely, uh, rarely occurs. When doing the weave, whether to the palm or the wrist, the tendency is to lift the tendon ends out of the wound. If the proximal weave is done second and is the point at which tensioning the construct is done, you have to set the tension by knotting the first two stitches of the weave with the tendon dropped back into the wound or the graft will be half a centimeter too long. The tension of the graft is then tested by the wrist tenodesis maneuver before completing the pull retarf weave. The finger should then lie in the cascade as on the bottom right. It's generally recommended to make the ring and little fingers a little tighter, favoring full flexion against full extension as these are the gripping fingers, and the index and middle a little slacker, favoring full extension against full flexion as these are the pinching fingers. In reality, whatever I do, I generally find that a single finger tendon graft either doesn't flex the finger quite fully to touch the pulp to the distal palm or crease, or it doesn't extend it fully at the DIP joint, one or the other. I don't know why, and it may just be a failing of my own, but it makes me feel that primary suture um, is more likely to give a perf perfect result than a, a flexor tendon graft. A technique used for a long time for secondary FBL repair uh, as an alternative to using a graft has been to transfer the ring finger FDS tendon to the thumb. And this can be done as a one or two stage procedure depending on the state of the FBL sheath in the thumb. The, if divided just proximal to the PIP joint, the ring finger FDS will reach the distal phalanx um, of the thumb con uh, comfortably. Um, this option is usually done in patients who present late and the FPL muscle in the forearm is either too involved in scar tissue or it feels too stiff on distal traction on the proximal tendon at surgery to be likely to give good function. It's also a good option if the, there is a lot of scarring uh, when one opens the forearm and the media and it's difficult to uh, separate the median nerve out of the, out of the scarring because tenalizing the FPL at that level um, to free, free up the, the muscle and proximal tendon may uh, end up with a, a divided median nerve. There are a few papers from 20 years ago confirming that flexor grafts do better if mobilized early. We use exactly the same regime of immediate mobilization after secondary surgery as we do after primary repair. The tendon un uh, unions are very much stronger than those of a primary repair, so early active mobilization has less risk. All of these cases are treated with antibiotics for five days postoperatively, as are tenolyses, as uh, infection will lose the game by creating so much more edema and fibrin glue that the freed tendons and grafts won't simply adhere again. I think these two new alternatives to grafting are likely to become more acceptable as worries over the technical difficulties of using them and also about the risks at their donor sites uh, disappear. Proximal bowstringing is a, a relatively unusual problem, probably because a lacerating injury, which is longitudinal or oblique enough to cut the whole length of the A2 pulley and a bit more distally, while leaving at least one flexor tendon intact is not common. Occasionally a severe crush injury with bursting lacerations of the skin and usually a badly comminuted proximal phalanx will include rupture of the A2 pulley. Also occasionally bowstringing is a result of bad previous surgery as in this case. We never see absence of the A4 pulley alone giving rise to more distal bowstringing. 
as the length of free tendon across the front of the DIP is too short. For distal bowstringing, as you see here, to happen requires that the whole length of the sheath distal to the A2 pulley is missing. And I think this is very rare. This is an iatrogenic problem. To get sight of the tendons for a tenolysis, our entry of the, of the tendon sheath is usually at the level of the A3 pulley. Often this leads to excision of the A3 and the adjoining C pulleys as they're in the way and they're stuck to the tendons. During the subsequent tenolysis, it's too easy to snap the A4 as it is often not only small but very flimsy and tightly bound to the underlying profundus. If this happens, we then have no pulleys beyond the A2. So I now start all secondary surgery by keeping some of the scar, uh, pull, uh, scar sheath around the PIP intact as an A3 pulley, just in case I snap the A4 later in the dissection. Proximal bowstringing in the presence of one or two intact flexors, or if a single stage grafting is carried out, demands a pulley uh, reconstruction which is strong enough to resist the tendon forces of immediate mobilization. Probably the commonest reconstruction used was that advocated by Lister in which a, a strong tissue such as the palmaris or extensor retinaculum is passed around the bone several times and sutured to itself. Bearing in mind that many cases undergoing flexor surgery have poor results because of extensor tendon tethering, um, I have some reservations about the Lister technique as it invades the extensor space, although it's always worked and I've used it. However, this isn't often as pulley reconstruction over intact tendons, which have to be mobilized immediately, is a, a rare operation uh, for me. The, uh, te the technique of fixing the new pulleys to the remnants of the sheath laterally uh, avoids invading the extensor space, but it's probably too weak to hold the tendons back if mobilizing immediately over functioning flexors, whether after primary repair or grafting. This paper was about rock climbers who snapped the A2 pulley, but the circumstances of these cases are different and the finger can be immobilized with no pressure on the pulley reconstruction for a month. Possibly the new and smallest bone tags might strengthen this technique sufficiently for our needs, although no one has reported this yet. We much more commonly have a need for pulley reconstruction when we explore a flexor secondarily and come across this sort of mess of scarring. Sometimes the removal of a completely welded inflexor or the last cut of the tenolysis destroys what was left of a weakened pulley and sometimes it's simply impossible to undo the, the scar tissue. For us this is obviously a situation for a two-stage tendon graft. The tendon you don't intend to use later as the motor for the graft, taken from more proximally as you see here, can be used as material to reconstruct the pulleys. The tendon is split longitudinally and opened out, then turned through 90 degrees. Uh, and this provides enough material to make as many pulleys as you want. Because there'll be no force on them for three to six months, they can be simply sutured to the remnant edges of the sheath to which they'll be strongly bound by the time they have to hold a tendon back. This technique also avoids the use of the extensor retinaculum to make pulleys as suggested by Lister, which I dislike as it leaves an obvious scar on the back of the wrist um, uh, for which there is no, no need. Whether there's a pulley problem or a skin problem or both, it's easier dealt with by two-stage grafting. If pulley and skin reconstructions are done at the first stage, the hand can rest post-operatively to allow the reconstructions to, to settle in. Once a tendon graft is in place, the hand needs immediate mobilization and reconstructions of the pulleys or the skin at the same time have no time to settle and heal. Uh, as I showed earlier, this approach allows one to advance skin of the distal palm into the finger to combat any minor subcutaneous scarring. And this is enough to deal with previously uncomplicated cases. Preoperatively, it's usually obvious from the nature of the primary injury and or the appearance of the finger if more skin is going to be needed to achieve full extension. Using the same starting incision, 
the finger is opened on the same side as the intended donor finger for a cross finger flap. And the mobilized skin is uh, then split at the PIP level uh, where the green lines are. Uh, and a cross finger flap fitted into the gap. And this solves the problem uh, quite adequately for moderate losses of skin. Reconstruction of the palm over tendon surgery is best done with local flaps if possible uh, to retain the peculiar properties of the palmar skin. Cutting large triangular flaps such as you see here, which once the fibers immediately below the skin are released, will slide considerably in any direction, was first described on the sole of the foot by Matthies and his colleagues. The blood supply of the flap comes up through the underlying pulp from the neurovascular bundles. While a, a very small flap may miss these vessels, big flaps are, are routinely safe. And several going in different directions or a very big one right across the palm can be used. These flaps are quick, easy and reconstruct like with like skin. Um, this one's being used as part of a finger reconstruction. Uh, they're also very useful if removing uh, palmar skin lesions, which are just bigger than one can close directly and preferable to a graft. For longitudinal defects in the palm, uh, this is a very useful technique. It uses bipedical flaps uh, on either side of the defect. Each bipedical flap includes a neurovascular bundle by dissecting laterally from the central wound um, in front of the tendons and below the neurovascular bundle. At the lateral margin of each palmar flap, only the skin is incised and the fibers in the subcutaneous tissue are, are broken by blunt scissor dissection to create a much more superficial wound. The palmar flap then slide in to close the central defect and the lateral wounds are epithelialized under dressings um, like a macash Jupiter's wound uh, while the hand is being mobilized. Larger skin losses need more elaborate fl uh, flap reconstruction and this is a very good way of resurfacing the whole palmar aspect of a finger when needed without moving to a free flap. This uses the thin skin and forearm fascia from the flexor aspect of the forearm uh, moved on the distally based ulnar artery as the pedicle. Unlike radial artery based flaps, the ulnar artery can be dissected free into the middle of the palm, so the flap reaches the tip of the finger quite comfortably. Alternatively, one can move the same skin as a free venous flap uh, or use one of the other new uh, mini free flaps to create uh, for this purpose. The, it should be a, a rare occasion, I think, in flexor tendon surgery to have to either amputate the finger in the finger or carry out a re-amputation um, for, uh, for uh, flexor tendon dysfunction alone um, for various reasons. First of all, it's cosmetically less attractive. Even the power loss of even one finger is significant. But worst of all, if one develops neuroma pain from the cut digital nerves of the amputated finger, then one can move a finger from, uh, from, from, having, from being a minor inconvenience to, uh, uh, to being a major problem, which may um, remove function of that hand completely and have huge economic consequences. The timing of secondary surgery is, is important to the result. Um, before one carries out a, the, a second stage of a graft or a secondary flexor procedure, uh, the finger should have lost its redness and be completely soft to palpation and hopefully have a, a, a full passive range of flexion. Um, if one doesn't wait for this, then the, the um, the response to the second surgery is often uh, quite fierce with a lot more inflammation and consequent scarring and tendency, tendency for, for adhesion of the tendons again. Um, it's also my experience that the, uh, 
uh, the time one has to wait is often longer than the two to three months that is generally uh, the, the recommendation in most textbooks. Um, lastly, I think it, uh, the assessment of tendons now in, this, in secondary surgery should be by the TAM system. Uh, boys uh, in 1971 used an assessment which accepted that the tendons would, that would the results uh, would be poorer than primary surgery and allowed for this. Um, but if one's going to make an honest comparison between primary and secondary surgery, then they should be, they should be investigated by the same techniques, uh, namely the TAM system. And thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions if I can. Great. Thank you very much for that, David. That, that's great. Barbara, the floor is yours. No, oh, <laughs> yes, you've had, I've had some great questions here. Now, first of all, we don't forget, there was a question from Antonio Landi. Uh, 